Good evening, and welcome to the Merrimack School Board's public hearing on budget items. This Monday, January 8th, rescheduled from January 4th. If you could please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Item number three is public participation. If anyone from the public would like to come and speak on budget issues, please come to the mic and state your name and address for the record. I'm trying to figure out if there's anyone that's not working for the school district here, and I'm thinking the answer is no. So we will close public participation because there is no public here. And we will go on to item number four, which is budget presentations. And at the table, queued up and ready to go because it is a cast of thousands tonight, we have the elementary schools. So we have James Mastercall Elementary School, Reeds Ferry Elementary School, and Thornton Ferry. Oh my goodness, Thornton's Ferry Elementary School. Um, so the principals are for MES, Michelle Romaine, and her assistant principal, Alicia, Alicia Hanson Prue, from uh, Reeds Ferry. Principal Kim Yarlot and Assistant Principal Rachel Schneider, and for Thornton's Ferry, Principal Bridie, Bridie Bellamere and Assistant Principal Julie DeLuca. Probably my worst delivery in a couple of years now. So sorry about that and welcome. Okay, thank you. I'm Kimberly Yarlat, principal of Reeds Ferry Elementary School, and maybe new to, well, definitely new to the table is Rachel Schneider, assistant principal at Reeds Ferry School, and Alicia Hanson Pru, assistant principal at Master Cola Elementary School. And I'm here to um, answer the questions that you propose, that you presented to us. Um, on behalf of my colleagues, I'll provide an overview of the 2018 2019 proposed school budgets. And then um, I will open, answer the questions and then open it up for <coughs> further questions that you might have. So just as an introduction, as in with the past, the 2018-2019 uh, budget proposals for this, the three schools continues to reflect priorities that are outlined in the Merrimack School District logic model by maintaining progress in the areas of literacy, numeracy, technology, and school climate. The budget also reflects the need to be fiscally responsible and to strive for minimal budgetary implications. The three uh, elementary schools worked closely with one another to establish collective <coughs> priorities. Common to all of our budgets is the furniture replacement account, which reflects the priority of replacing classroom student desks and chairs. We anticipate this replacement to be completed in 2020-2021 budget. Um, the vision for the ongoing plan will include the eventual replacement of other worn out furniture such as bookcases, uh, tables, coat closets, etc. Also common to the three elementary schools budget is the amount that sits in the math text account. The cost is attributed to the need to focus on the adoption of materials for special education teachers, for Title I staff, for gifted and talented teachers and to ensure that all professional staff have access to their own materials for the purpose of differentiated instruction K through four. Uh, part of this program includes an online digital component which parents can access at home for the purpose of doing tutorials with their, with their children, for playing games, online games, and for the teachers we can actually do the assessments um, right in the classroom online. This digital um, component along with the student handbooks um, is part of what was a six-year uh, subscription with Envisions. So we are in year one right now, and in year two, in the proposed budget, is to enhance the materials that we have for all professional staff. So I want to thank you for closely examining our budgets and providing us with clarifying questions in advance to tonight's meeting. Um, I'll read through your questions, provide the answers, and then invite you to provide some more, uh, any further clarifications that you may need. So the first question comes from uh, School Board Chair uh, Shannon Barnes, and it says, um, it reads like this, Thornton's Ferry School talks about adjustable desks and chairs, and others do not. What is the difference in quality? Would the other schools benefit from adjustable units if not in use already? And this comes from the line item for furniture replacement. 
Um, and the answer to that is a good question. Was a matter matter of verbiage. Um, for all three schools actually use the same vendor, and the chairs that we get are either adjustable K through two or three through four. So we all get adjustable chairs. Is the short answer. So thank you for that question. Um, and <coughs> the next question, would you have that comes from? Um, comes from Andy Schneider, and it it's, reads as follows, and it's regarding the math text. This is the first time I've seen music text, sorry? I'm sorry, the music text, mm -hmm. sorry. This is the first time I've seen music text budgeted, and I'm curious as to what the music area is that this will cover. So in fact, um, Master Cole Elementary School has not accessed <coughs> this text account in the past, and the current music teacher seeks to access this line item for text that support the curriculum in the musical and concerts. So it was a matter of teacher preference, the instructor's preferences. <coughs> so have these been used in the past in a different account? Or is this a first? They, they have not. The, the, I'm sorry, do you want to answer that? Are you OK? Yeah. OK, go ahead. So some of um, the funding for what we would like to now use the text accounts for, uh, music for the concert, the fourth grade musical, things like that. Actually, our parent group has funded some of that. Okay. So at this point, it would be moving it into our budget. Okay, so this is taking away from what the parents group would have funded and bringing it into self-funding through the operating budget. Then. Yes, in addition to our music teacher adding programs to the music, um, for example, okay. the bells program and things like that. Thanks. And the other question um, comes from the reading text account, the um, 8641 account. And this area has a relative noticeable increase over the other school's budget items. Can you provide additional details as to what items are being added? So we thank you very much for this query. <laughs> um, when your query came through, it was discovered that the Thornton's Ferry School inadvertently used the figure that was proposed for the adoption of full day kindergarten. So we're requesting that the board make an amendment to the Thornton's Ferry reading text account, 8641, from $21,054 to $18,614. So at the time, we were kind of developing um, parallel budgets, one with the inclusion of full day kindergarten and one without so it was a mistake on our part so we thank you for, the, for bringing that to our attention okay the next question um, comes from uh, board member Cinda Gualumi and it her question is regarding the furniture replacement thank you for your question and it says please describe where we stand on any multi-year furniture replacement plans and so this is kind of a two-pronged question we've had to do a lot of adjustments to our original replacement plans that were five years, six, six years, seven years out because of deferments, et, et cetera, and priorities. So what we decided to do as the three lower elementary schools is to prioritize the replacement of student desks and chairs. So as I, as I mentioned in my opening, we have um, two more years of looking so that we'll have all the desks and chairs replaced. The second part of the question is um, relative to what happens to this furniture replacement account. So given that things have been deferred, we are looking to um, build out another five-year account that will focus on other priorities, um, such as the bookcases, tables, um, cubbies, et cetera. So we anticipate another five-year plan to follow um, the current two-year replacement of the desks and chairs. <clears throat> Okay, the next question comes from um, Naomi Schoenfeld, and it is relative to the gifted and talented line item. And the question is as follows. How many students are served by the gifted and talented program? Is this funding level sufficient to provide meaningful enrichment and differentiation? So the response was that at, at Master Cola Elementary School, there are currently 13 students that are in the um, <coughs> what we would consider the tier three gifted and talented program, meaning that they qualified with certain assessments. Um, at Thornton's Ferry School, there are currently 12 students who are being serviced by the gifted and talented teachers at the tier three level. And at Reed's Ferry School, there are six for a total of 31 students. And then in our tier two um, level, 
which is uh, the gifted and talented teacher will do push in in the classroom for enrichment purposes. And that's approximately, it varies, it's about 12 to 22 students at each building. And these are these students who have um, been identified as benefiting <coughs> from the enrichment, which would include, you know, in the areas of writing, math, reading, research, STEM activities, um, student interest based activities. At tier one, we have um, our gifted and talented teachers basically look at the whole school climate and look at enrichment activities that are brought into the school. So that includes the New Hampshire Historical Society. Um, it includes this owls, owl presentation. It includes um, this, the science um, person that comes in, um, an invention convention, various activities for each of the buildings. Okay. So once again, I want to thank you for providing us with questions in advance. It really helps us to organize our presentation and to find out what queries you might have. So I'm just going to turn it over to you and see if you have any additional questions that you would like to clear clarified or is there anything from the rest of the board <clears throat> seeing oh I'm sorry Naomi I'm going to do a quickie follow-up on the gifted and talented question um, I asked something similar for the other schools and it's just something that occurred to me as I was reading through the budgets and that is I realized that um, I'm sure that you make wonderful use of all the materials in your schools across the gifted and talented programs. They don't necessarily or should not need their own materials. But I was comparing numbers, and I just wanted to be sure that those haven't um, been neglected, frankly, okay, uh, as when it goes along in that. So thank you for that. So um, the gifted and we feel that th that is sufficient funding. And one of the reasons is that the gifted and talented teachers can access all the classroom materials as well as techn technology, um, any devices, the library, um, the STEM room, if you have a STEM room or a maker space. So they have access to all of these other materials. So they have, at this point, they felt that it's been sufficient. Also, at least at Reeds Ferry School, the Parent Faculty Association provides a little bit of funds. So thank you for that. Any other questions from the board? Seeing none, um, we conclude the elementary school portion of the show this evening. And thank you for your hard work. Thank you for having thank us. You. Thank you. We are on to the next item, or next uh, group, which is the Merrimack Middle School. So um, the next to the table will be Adam Carragher, the principal, and Shauna Diamore, the assistant principal. Welcome. Thank you. It's a little, <laughs> little pause for transition there. Um, thank you very much for having us and inviting us here. So, um, as 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 stated by the elementary school, you know the Merrimack Middle School budget for 2018-19 is very much in tune with our district logic model, that paying attention to literacy, numeracy, technology, and school climate and safety. Um, Towards that end, uh, this budget reflects also the adoption of a new 8th grade algebra program as well as the continued support of the newly implemented math curriculum. Uh, the proposal includes a finalization of a five-year plan for the replacement of worn out labs and art room stools. It also includes a replacement of one cafeteria table and an addition of six bookshelves for support materials in the language arts classrooms. There uh, is funding requested related to transportation in support of a seventh grade uh, science field trip as well as an eighth grade social studies field trip uh, as requested and reviewed in last year's budget cycle. Um, so there were specific questions which I'd like to kind of jump into right now. Um, board member Schneider and Guayumi um, had uh, inquired about the math text account. So currently, the, ma the Math Envisions program, we are in the first year uh, for a majority of our math students, but we do find ourselves in a little bit of a different situation as uh, we are also waiting to adopt a new math curriculum component for the eighth grade students. So um, 
components of this uh, budgeted account are to support uh, in a similar fashion, the special educators or those who didn't have the resource materials for them specifically to provide for that, but also knowing that the math curriculum committee is currently working on and looking towards piloting a math program that will affect us and will be in sync with what goes on in an Algebra one classroom at the high school level uh, for a, a percentage of our eighth grade students. Um, so. It, Ultimately, this, this amount will likely decrease um, after the, the full implementation of that program. Uh, Board Member Schneider and Gualyumi also inquired about this. Oh. Go ahead. Yeah, I, yep. just, I just want to clarify on that one before you move on to the mm -hmm. other one. So when you talk about sort of rolling this in, the budget that we're looking at, the proposed budget, will do you believe that there will be it will drop after this year's proposed budget, or will there be another year of ramp up and then it will ramp down? I would imagine there would be a decrease this after, so this, after this budget, budget cycle. Okay. Yes. Well, just Because with all the schools, they're all adopting the new math program. So I'm right. just trying to figure out where the peak is to make sure we fulfill the need that we have, but also then rationalize when we'll get down to sort of a run rate after that. So Correct. just trying to understand with each school. Yep. Yep. Okay. Thanks. Very good. Oh, yes. Actually, this is more of a comment for uh, Chairman Barnes, but I'm wondering if after we get through the budget season, if maybe the math uh, curriculum committee could come and speak with us. and Because we had a lot of questions, I think, across the board on the math tax, the math program, and especially because it's so new, getting the feedback, how's it going, what do we need <coughs> to, um, you know, what do we need to do to optimize um, or supplement the program, what are lessons learned, um, and so on, and, so, and, and also future budget years. I think that would be a really valuable exercise. I think that'd be great. So if we can just consider that to preclude for a new business down the road, that'd be great. Or reviewed business, so no problem. All right, um, moving along, uh, Board Member Schneider and Gualyumi also inquired about the social studies textbook <laughs> account. Uh, so the current copyright dates for the 7th and 8th grade social studies texts are 2007, um, which is, is nearing, a, uh, nearing their ability to be able to continue being used. Uh, so that funding is specifically to refurbish uh, textbooks, but also to replace some, uh, if possible, um, depending on, on the need at that time. It's, uh, so when I talk about refurbishing, it's primarily rebinding of textbooks. Um, which is which is something we do to just prolong the useful life of of texts. Um, we well, also was asked about uh, by board member Schneider. Oh, yep. There you go. So just, I thought you were going down a road where you said that these books were old and the material maybe was out of date in social studies because the world economics have changed mm -hmm. and stuff. But then you mentioned that you're just refreshing and rebinding. So you're not changing what you it's. Just make sure the books are either replaced or rebound. So yeah, I, I'm sorry. I did not mean to, to lead you astray as far as, <laughs> as, far as we're, yes, we're, right. we're, we're looking to continue using this curriculum uh, for the time being, these, okay. these textbooks for the time being. Okay. Um, you know, a lot of those materials are definitely supplemented. Um, you know, the seventh grade curriculum is ancient history, which isn't the quite as changed. shifting and changing as much hope, right? um uh, and the u.s history really we, you know they start uh, around the time of the declaration of independence and move forward and so it's not it's not current geog it's not current right day things and things like that right what one question for maybe marge or, or matt can answer does any of this get covered in the rebinding that that's part of the library that's library books rebound this is specific to the one okay yeah. great Got it. Yep. Thanks. Um, moving along again. Uh, so board member Schneider and Gualyumi inquired about the furniture replacement account. Um, so we are uh, we are completing, yeah, there's a lot of common, common ground there. So we are completing the final of a five-year plan um, that was started, uh, I want to say, roughly six years ago uh, in replacing the different um, lab stools throughout the building. Uh, you know, the reason that it actually looks like a significantly more amount is because we also included, after consulting with Tom Tussaud, uh, the head of maintenance, that it would be wise to start thinking about cafeteria tables instead of having to replace all at once, maybe a, 
a smaller number over the course of years to uh, to make that so it's not a significant cost, as well as uh, six bookshelves that we're just finding we're in need to uh, provide for our language arts classrooms. Um, yep. So this is a question into, it's not a question, it's a comment as we go through our further deliberations. So when I see the five-year plan all of a sudden be intermingled with things like cafeteria tables or things, the question comes up as to what do we need this year versus what can we sort of ramp out? Because when I looked at the number, I thought it was you're, because that it, some of it had been cut in previous years that used this year to catch up with everything in the five year, when in fact that may not be completely true. So I guess as we go through the budget discussion, understand do we need everything that's in here? Can we make it more gradual? I mean, it's more, not necessarily for something for you to answer right now. It's just some, an observation as we go through and look at these furniture updates and things. Very good. Well, I guess if it's something that you could provide just based on your line of thinking, um, if you can segregate what would be, would have been uh, part of the five year furniture replacement plan to what is incremental furniture replacement that you uh, put into this budget. If you can separate that out, though, I think yeah. it would be a, yeah. a request we'd make. If that could be provided before our deliberations, that'd be great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Cinda? Yeah, and I had the same line of thinking. It, it made me look at it and think, wait, you know, did we cut this last year? Um, you know, I was just trying to kind of make sure it all matched up. So I think, you know, for that, when it's, even if it's part of it is part of the plan that was originally set up and other furniture is maybe added because we think we need to add it to that line item. The fact that maybe in the future budgets too, just making sure that it's broken down because obviously it raises a flag. We're looking at it and we're like, wait, um, it really wasn't this much last year, so. Thank you. Did you ever hear that, March? Mm -hmm. I did. Okay, sorry. Different layout. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh. oh, okay. All right. Very good. Onward. Onward. Uh, so, Board Member Schneider uh, asked about the family and consumer science uh, equipment replacement. Um, specifically, you know, a little bit more detail about what's going on, I suppose, with the refrigerator. So, it's at a point where, you know, the refrigerator has been there for eight years now, or uh, will be eight years at the end of the school year. And just over the course of those eight years, you know, 600 kids um, passing through its door, <laughs> uh, the handle is actually uh, actually broken. And our maintenance crew was able to, to put it back together and, and make it kind of as a temporary fix, but not something that's going to last, you know, over the course of years. So uh, became a necessity to look to replace that particular item. So I'm going to ask a question of... Mr. Johnson over there in the peanut gallery, he's waving. So there's family consumer science labs that are at the high school as well. Do we know whether this, the refrigerator length of time in the middle school is similar to what we see at the high school? I can answer that, but I do know that we've had to replace appliances in the past. Being refrigerators or washing machines. Okay. Yeah, we've had to Okay. So his, his response to those at home was, he, we have at the high school had to replace similar things. Whether the time frame's the same, he doesn't know offhand, but but we have had to do that. Okay, that's, I just, when you, when somebody hears you see a refrigerator after seven years, it's like, that seems short, but you're right, there's the wear and tear of yeah. opening many more times at our house refrigerator might or something yeah. like that. So. Yeah. Um, so I'm now going to pass over to Mrs. DeMore to, to address the field trip questions. Hi, everyone. Uh, School Board Chair Barnes and Vice Chair Schneider inquired about the field trip accounts. The seventh grade trip to Squam Lake is tied to our life science curriculum and it replaces Camp Sargent in the sense that it's a common experience for all seventh grade students. Currently, the cost is approximately $15 a student prior to transportation. Of course, if students aren't able to afford the fees, um, we find a way to fund their trip, which is true for any trip at the middle school. And the eighth grade trip to the Lowell Mills directly correlates to the eighth grade social studies curriculum on the Industrial Revolution. Both trips are in the budget for 100% of the transportation costs, and it does not include the facility fee of either of the field trips. So now Mr. Carragher and I are here to answer any further inquiries that the board may have. Are there any other questions of the middle school budget? So. On that note, so this, the Camp Sergeant is no longer the two days in the year, correct? 
Correct, based on um, survey results from parents, students, and faculty. Okay. Mm -hmm. So in the Squam, like in a one day, we'll take care of that, and all of this replaces what would have been a three-day trip to Mytina back in the day that other parents would have sent their kids on, correct? Correct. So it's going from a three-day to a two-day to a one-day. Right. Okay. Um, any other questions from the board? Okay. Seeing none. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Huh? You, you really did dominate the night there, Andy. Uh, it's not, the night is still young. <laughs> the night is still young. Here comes the high school. So uh, on that note, we do uh, have the high school coming up next. And I uh, invite to the table uh, Principal Ken Johnson and Assistant Principals Peter Bergeron and Rich Zampieri. Welcome and thank you. Well, good evening, and thank you for having us here tonight. Um, as has been the tradition of the high school, I'd like to do an introductory piece for the benefit of the viewing audience, if I may. So I'd like to point out that many of the line items have been reduced or level funded. However, there are some proposed increases, new texts, and additional equipment in several departments, which will add to and enhance our programs. Marginal increases in various supply accounts can be attributed to higher costs for basic supplies. Regarding the new texts, the following are requested. The math department is requesting new texts and support materials for Algebra 1, Geometry, and Algebra 2 classes which are aligned with the new district math curriculum. The business department is requesting new accounting texts aligned with the National Academy of Finance Standards as well as the curriculum approved by the Southern New Hampshire University for two dual enrollment classes. Regarding additional equipment, the following items are requested. The Technical Education Department requests one engine start cart and one engine repair trainer to support the automotive program. And the Art Department requests one large format color printer to be used by both the technology education and art classes to support the curriculum. Uh, as was the case with the others, uh, members of the board have submitted several questions to us. I believe the first may be a pagination issue, but it's been raised by uh, Chairperson Barnes, where she points out uh, in Section 8300, the page with NHIAA officials costed out is page 27, question mark. If corrected, it will throw off the rest of the M8 budget book, that the MHS budget book. Pete, you want to address that? No, just as you know, Mr. Johnson has said, it's just a, a page numbering uh, uh, issue. I know in my book, for some reason, it's fine, but I guess in other books, it's off. So, but mine's fine because <coughs> yours was not. So right. I don't know how that took place. I think we just call it a pagination, pagination. issue with no impact on the budget. But uh, Chairman Barnes or Chairperson Barnes does also ask why is the NHIAA membership folded under co-curricular membership fees, and how much of the total is it? Pete. I'm going to have to bring this all the way over, but uh, good evening. Uh, so as a school, we've always placed the, uh, the NHIAA membership fee under our co-curricular memberships. Uh, the cost for this membership is $6,250. Uh, we don't have a separate membership line for athletics. Uh, we have in our athletic supply uh, budget that, that line item, we have like entry fees. But typically, since I've been at the high school, that NHIA a membership has always been included in the co-curricular membership. So, and actually the motivation for that question was we've been so... Uh, careful to cost out how we are the parity that we're trying to get between you know the athletic teams and the co-curricular academic based competition uh, space so having that folded in how much of the how much of a dent does it make and it's probably close to 30 percent so on that note when you look at it you know with all the the groups that we have um, how much you know is that really taking up and you know by separating it out the thought was yeah, we can really keep them separate and distinct in our bu our budget books, and we know how much of our funding is actually going to sports versus things like um, 
the U.S. History Day competition, the robotics, the Science Olympiad, and on and on. So, which are definitely different, different areas of, of competition. Good point. So, thank you. Uh, Co-chair Andy Schneider was very busy asking us several questions. And what I'm going to do, again, to consistent with that, Andy, is I'm going to read the question. I knew you'd you just, want to cut it. It was the first day of, vac of my vacation, <laughs> so I was coming down off a of work high, so I was just busy. We can see. So what we're going to do is I'm going to read the questions <laughs> and have uh, the assistant principals who are in charge of that department answer those questions. But we thank you for them. So first question, what are the details behind the significant increase in upkeep of the district print shop equipment, and will this be ongoing? Rich. Uh, the district print shop maintenance uh, line part is uh, not in our budget the last two years. Um, the increase is comparable to the amount budgeted in, in many previous years. To my knowledge, it will be an ongoing <coughs> expense at that line item. Regarding science transportation, Andy says, my expectation is that these are existing field trips that are now being entered into the budget based on last year's discussion about them being fully funded by students previously, correct? And if so, is this 100% of the funding required or something that has student contribution as an assumption? Rich. In fact, these are new field trips uh, designed for a new interdisciplinary course, uh, Project Earth, though other groups have gone to the Museum of Science as well. Uh, this line item should uh, fully fund the transportation portion of those three trips. Uh, students should, would still pay for entry fees. Regarding business textbooks, can you provide more information on the standards that are required or that are requiring the updated text? Also, in the case of the dual enrollment program with Southern New Hampshire University, are these textbooks ones that would normally be used in MHS or are they special ones specifically for Southern New Hampshire University? If specific to dual enrollment, is there any reason why students are not contributing if they aren't already. Again, Rich? Uh, the current accounting texts are 18 years old. Um, <coughs> national accounting standards as well as the curriculum standards supported by the National Academy of Finance have changed in, in those 18 years. Due to the age of the current textbooks, these are texts we would request for all of our students, whether they are uh, in the Academy of Finance or not, or if they choose the dual enrollment path through SNU. The texts are not SNU specific, and students who choose dual enrollment through SNU pay towards that option. So they pay for the credit that they receive. It's, it's what they Correct. Pay. The textbooks are the same regardless of whether they're in this dual enrollment or not. Any student who takes okay. accounting <coughs> dual I, I asked. I asked only because sometimes running starts with dual enrollments have specific texts, and I just wanted to make sure that that wasn't no, the case. This, this is. Okay, thanks. Andy asks regarding math texts, will this be a one-year rollout for the new textbooks for the updated math curriculum, or will this be a multi-year process similar to MMS? Any idea of the future costs range, not specifics? Again, Rich. Uh, this is a one-year purchase for multiple sections of three courses. In six years, we may need to buy continuing site licenses when the current ones expire. So you, you hope to fully fund what you need, and then in six years you do an, an update. That's what you're – most likely not the text, just the site licenses. Site license. so, so this is a one-year text bubble. So right. Okay. Regarding technical education, the two items, engine start cart and engine repair trainer, are significant cost items. Is this the start of a multi-year plan to bring in higher cost items to enhance the mechanics curriculum at MHS? Would be good to talk about the overall program direction and the impacts to ongoing costs to the districts. Again, that would be rich. Uh, the engine repair uh, trainer would complement um, four like items that were donated this year to the program. Uh, this would complete a class set, per se, so that teams of three students could work simultaneously. Um, the start cart would be able to test the success of those students' progress on the, on the uh, trainers uh, for all of the units. So I know the reason I asked this question is at the beginning of the year when we didn't know if we were having an instructor that could do the automotive program that we were talking about using a dip, you know, uh, I think it was Manchester Community College's facility and their equipment. Now that we have an instructor that's part of MHS, what I was trying to figure out is aside from these items that you're putting in this year, 
do you see strategically other multi-year sort of bringing in other equipment in? Because what I'm trying to figure out is are we building a stronger and larger sort of mechanic shop inside the high school as opposed to moving outside like through a community college program? I would say like any program, the success of the program is based on student requests and enrollments. As long as those enrollments stay strong, the teacher may see fit to replace equipment that had not been replaced by the previous uh, instructor who was there nearly for, you know, 40 years. So I, I won't say that there will definitely be requests, but there could be. It really depends upon the needs of that particular class, like electrical engines might need something down the road. Right. I, I guess maybe this is a request. So similar to the math request that we had, it would be good to understand how MHS is going to move forward with its mechanics program because as you're, the, the previous instructor was there forever right and then he left and then we were going mm -hmm. through this decision process over the summer do we outsource do we use it in-house so it'd be good to understand sort of what the plan is now that we're having it in-house and and what's there and and what co what breadth is covered so we know mm -hmm. whether we're bringing in new concepts or whether we're just keeping with that it's, uh, I don't know a lot about it. So that's sure, and I would say that uh, we're very fortunate and very pleased with the new instructor. Uh, we see enrollments staying the same, if not increasing, within the limits that we have for safety. We currently serve close to 120 students, as opposed to perhaps the 10 that might have been able to go up to, to MCC. So we feel like we're reaching even more students within the school. Um, and if, like any class, uh, there are enhancements to a program based on requests and, and student interest. We'll come forward with those requests. I, I'm not aware of a specific that I could give you right now, um, but I'm sure the teacher is um, interested in keeping the program going as, as I would say we are, based on the current results of student uh, requests. And uh, <clears throat> Michael, you also have a question? Yes, um, in regards to the uh, a follow-on basically to what Andy was talking about. Um, one of the things that was interesting to me when you were talking about the Manchester Community College is that the individuals that took that course were pretty much ready to enter the workforce. Um, obviously when, Ken, when you gave me the uh, overview of the mechanics room and stuff like that, we were far inferior to most products that are out there or what people are using for uh, automotive uh, when they get onto the workforce. I was wondering if there's a way to actually find out what the gap is that the school district has today compared to what um, tools are available when someone goes out into the workforce and actually maybe coming up with either an understanding of the gap so that there might be a plan to get the shop up to speed or look at w other ways to actually get funding or, or even put out there that, hey, this is what the school district's looking for. Um, for tools and seeing if we might be able to be lucky enough to have someone um, donate or something like that. So I, I'd, I'd really like to see, and obviously not for this budget cycle, but just come back maybe after the budget cycle to actually see what that gap is and then come with a plan to maybe get our students so that when they leave the high school, they're workforce ready. Well, that would be discussion for the administration then to bring to the central office about do we want to pursue that path to making that program a, a certification program like they are at many CTE schools, which we are not. Um, and, and that would be interesting to be able to provide that opportunity. It would take a lot of prior planning and, and certainly we, uh, as we got this year four trainers donated, it would be nice if that's the direction we went. Um, but that would be a, a discussion down the road. Currently students are able to access that kind of program by going down to Nashua. Yeah, so I, I guess I'd ask the administration, I'd like to see it as, I'm not sure if the board as a whole would, but kind of see what that would take and, and if it's possible. And if it's not, then it's not, but maybe to spend some time looking into that. Mark? <coughs> so you know we do uh, quarterly programs for curriculum review. So we'll have math and we'll have auto mechanics. Excellent. And, and I think what came from last year's um, you know, when we did approach MCC at the end of last year, it was because we didn't have a contingency plan for the automotive department. But I think even walking away from it, knowing that we did have a good, suitable teacher in the district, that doesn't mean we have to um, abandon one plan because there, we have, you know, a, an in-house plan as well. So, you know, I think that there's always opportunity to collaborate with 
a Manchester Community College on a number of areas, and I think that you know we have strong relationships at the district level, at the central office level, with uh, the State Department of Education, with Manchester Community College's um, president as well. That there's a lot of opportunity that we can we can navigate. The one thing that when they when the Manchester Community College came to us and talked to us, a lot of their stuff is provided by the uh, the automotive um, manufacturers. So therefore, the stuff that they're working on is actually provided by the manufacturer themselves and their specialty equipment. And, and so when they're going out in the field, it's because they're working on their certified content, their certified equipment. So I think that there's definitely, you know, we need to do a, a short-term fix. Um, if we didn't have a fix, we do. It sounds like we have a very good one. And now we have to give them the tools to thrive and create that, um, that groundswell again so, so kids can migrate and um, aspire up to, in say a junior senior year, the Manchester Community College program. And the one caveat of that program was that you needed to have an active driver's license with a clean driving record. So that was um, exclusive for a lot of our students who wouldn't necessarily be driving, even if they were of driving age for what, if their personal readiness um, situation. So I think having both is something that you know, is not out of the realm of, of opportunity. So, but uh, more to come on that, I'm sure. But you know, I definitely don't want anyone to think that we We would agree talking. with you. And we've uh, I actually reached out to Megan from MCC right before the holiday break. And we've been trying to coordinate our schedules to see, uh, continue that possibility of continuing that relationship for our students. That's very encouraging. Yeah. Thank you. Excellent. Um, Nicely done, Rich. Yep, uh, one Andy, one uh, additional set of questions regarding equipment replacement. These will be addressed by Pete. You say, can you provide more details on the chairs for volleyball and what is the requirement here? And does the spirit mat replace something existing or is it something new related to competition? More details would be helpful. Pete? So I, I got a handout. chairs are very light and uh, they, uh, they can't withstand, uh, if you're just sitting for that entire period, that's not a problem, but you know, we have our athletes getting up and down uh, constantly. So uh, this is a dedicated athletic chair and these, can, these chairs can be used not only during the volleyball season, but also during the girls' uh, basketball games and special functions. Uh, they're more durable. You know the athletes and coaches are getting up and down constantly, uh, so hopefully that's that answered the the volleyball <laughs> so question. So bottom line is it's chairs that can be used for, across multiple disciplines of athletics, yes. not just for volleyball. It's, you know, yes. Without a lot of context, you're trying to well, what do you put strategic chairs on the volleyball court to? Mm -hmm. And the volleyball chairs, and basketball chairs. <laughs> no, this. Uh, thanks for the explanation. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> And the cooler locker yeah. So the uh, the mat, I think, that was just the uh, the follow up question. The spirit mats. Yes. So the spirit mats uh, that is going the one we would like is we'll, would replace the existing one, uh, which is uh, nine years old. Uh, it's been used for many uh, during basketball games. We pull parts of it out. Uh, we transport that mat between different buildings. We use it for pep rallies. You know, the footprint, the footprint of the uh, mat uh, is, is for competition. So when, if we host a competition, we're well prepared. And we'll, when we go to uh, our competitions during the year where, you know, we have that same footprint. So it's, it's really worn. So, you know, that's why we need a new one. Can we also say that it, because the other one is worn, it might be a safety issue for the, the competition too. I mean, yes. is it worn to the point where it's probably problematic as well? It, it it's getting there. You know th that type of mat. You can't believe it or not. You can recondition a uh, wrestling mat. You can't recondition this type of uh, cheerleading mat that we have. Okay. So. Okay, Cinda also has several questions for the administration. We begin with a question about the 504 coordinator at MHS. 
Uh, she says, curious why this doesn't show up in the student services budget. Uh, this may be a question for Matt. Actually, I believe I can answer that question uh, by stating that 504 is regular education. It is not special education. Okay. Um, also, some questions for Pete, again, regarding athletics equipment. Some may be repeated here, but she asks, can you tell me more about the helmet and shoulder pad repair process? $12,300 seems like a lot of money for repairs in comparison to the cost of $2,000 to replace up to 15% of new helmets that fail repair and conditioning. Um, she states that she's not questioning the need for safety by any means, nor would she suggest skimping on safety. She just wants to understand the costs associated. In addition, there's also another line item, athletics equipment repair or replace, MHS, for $18,500, of which part of that cost is explained as to replace 20 football helmets and 15 shoulder pads, which are beyond repair or reconditioning. Uh, she's wondering if there's some duplication in the budget for the helmets. Can you please explain? So what I'm going to attempt to do is uh, to go over three of these uh, line items, uh, the ath uh, athletic equi equipment repairs, the athletic supplies, and the athletic equipment replacement, those three uh, athletic budget line items. So if you could just bear with me, I'll, I'll go through them. So the first one is on, you've, you'll find on page four, and that's the athletic equipment repair account. This is for athletic equipment that needs to get reconditioned and repaired. The helmets get sanitized, the inner pads replaced, new paint applied, and de decals affixed. And the football helmets are certified by the National Operating Committee on Standards for Athletic Equipment. Uh, and football helmets need to be replaced every 10 years. So they have a shelf life of 10 years. Uh, and shoulder pads are sanitized and repaired too. So that is basically the reconditioning uh, line item. The next one is the athletic supply uh, line item. And that is for a supply budget for athletics. All consumables such as practice, game balls, school books, entry, entry fees from this, uh, this account, uh, for example, to play in preseason tournaments, holiday tournaments, and typically freshmen and JVs play in postseason tournaments. Uh, we also utilize this account for uh, ice rental at Westside Arena for a hockey team, rental time for a swim team at the Y in the Merrimack, and finally we rent field space at the GPS fields in Bedford for both uh, soccer and lacrosse. In the case of the football helmets, after we send out our helmets to be reconditioned, some are beyond repair and thus cannot be certified. This is why we budget the $2,000 for the, for the helmets. Uh, the athletic equipment replacement account. So every year we know at the end of the season we'll need a certain amount of football helmets because they've reached that 10-year uh, shelf life. Shoulder pads can be repaired, but like helmets, some are beyond repair, and the company that we go through for reconditioning uh, will let us know how many shoulder pads will not be suitable for use. Uh, and then this is redundant, but I talk about the high quality athletic chairs make sense make sense since athletes and coaches are constantly getting up and down from these chairs uh, so and also the spirit the spirit mats in that athletic replacement account for this year too so i'm not not sure if that helped you. <coughs> So I'm, I'm just trying to understand why um, I think I'm still struggling to, I'm still confused on kind of the, what seems like an overlap to me. So that's, is it because, and maybe you can try to rephrase it, <laughs> rephrase your response. So I'm trying to understand a little bit better, I think, what, where those costs are associated. Does it, did it make sense so, to everyone else? It, it kind of did because I think some were 10 years old and they planned to replace them because they were 10 years old. Others, they had every intention because they were less than 10 years old to keep using them with reconditioning, but they didn't pass inspection. So therefore, it had to be purchased in addition to those that they knew would be cycled out because of their 10-year lifespan. We have to send our helmets out every year. And uh, we already know, or the coach knows, which ones have reached, reached their shelf life. But then there's the ones that, you know, they, they can't, uh, that they find that are suitable not to be certified. 
So there's a certain percentage. We, have, we know a certain percentage every year we have to uh, replace. So the one line item covers the ones that we absolutely know. And the other one is, it's a subset of the reconditioning decal yes. placing, and then there's just some surprises in there that um, show up every year. And that's what we budget for, and that's why it's separate, because it's part of the overall reconditioning. Is that correct? Okay. Because they wouldn't be visible to the eye. Right. But they would, the people who are reconditioning would know that this is being yeah. repaired. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they, they just say it's not, yeah. And, okay. you know, they're making really great advances in, you know, all that helmet technology and concussion protocol. Uh, so I think we're right on top of that, our athletic director. Okay, Michael? Yeah, I, I don't. I'm, I think I'm with Cindy here. It's not the concern of whether they need to be replaced or not. It's a question of if replaces, replaces, replace. So why aren't they both in the same budget? So you're saying basically, knowing that you're going to get about two thousand dollars worth of the best, you know, worst case scenarios that to the in, other in, in, in under shelf life, just lump the two together, knowing that it's going to be replacements either because of timing out of the system or because um, the use create an extreme need to replace them early. See, so lumping them together versus segregating them out. See that or if it's beneficial accounting wise to actually know what is replaced before the 10 years, then I can possibly see it, but then just change the line item. So that says like, you know, um, maybe it's a replacement prior to expected life cycle, lifespan or something like that. So that's a little more detailed. So pre expiration date, like a gallon of milk. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, great. Uh, okay. Cinda also asks a question with regards to student transportation to Nashua North, Nashua South, and Alvern High School for career technical education programs. Uh, the question is, is the increase based on how we are tracking in the current year budget or due to contractual increases? That is actually um, uh, an increase of 3.5%, which is a contractual increase per year. With regards to athletic transportation, Cinda asks, how do we handle home games in places that are not at Merrimack? For example, GPS fields in Bedford or home hockey games, etc. Is transportation provided to these places or intended to be provided? Oh, that's, that, that's a good question. And uh, what, what happens is student athletes get rides from their parents or sometimes the, those student athletes. So, for example, we play our home hockey games at Westside Arena. The students who have their, their license, you know, they'll drive there. Uh, the same for uh, the, the students who are old enough to have the license, you know, they'll, they'll drive to the, uh, the GPS fields. Uh, uh, but the parents will bring them. Uh, as as well, like I, I just mentioned, but you know safety we always have safety in mind if the weather is such you know we're gonna we're gonna postpone uh, that uh, that athletic contest. Our younger players, the freshmen and some of the sophomores, they'll play some of their games over at Reed's Ferry, the fields over there. They will get on you know we have our first wave and second wave buses right after school they'll get transported and they'll go to Reed's Ferry and get off right there I'm not sure if you knew that um, Andy and Michael so so let's take hockey for a minute let's assume that you play Central and they play at the West Side Arena as well if it's a home game the students are required to provide their own transportation but if it's an away game we will provide the transportation? Right. If it's an away game, we would provide the transportation. Right. We will, you know, exactly. If we were playing at, if our hockey team was playing at JFK, we would, we would, you know, have bus transportation for that. Right. But if we were the home team playing there, I mean, I guess the, to me, what if we can't provide the facility and we have a home game, we don't provide transportation, but if it's at the same facility and we're the away team, we do provide transportation. That's what I'm hearing in your description, right? Okay. It seems weird, but so, yeah. well, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay, Michael and Cinda. Um, 
I, I guess I, I'm, I'm think I'm hearing what Andy's saying is that facility should facility should be an extension of the school district wherever the facility is we should be transporting to the children to the facility my question would also then be a follow-up and maybe to the administration is there uh, a concern for um, who is responsible if we are if we are if the sport is being provided by the school and we're giving that transportation do we need to assure that the students that are getting a ride from their friends actually have authority from their parents to say yes and kind of releasing the school district for that is to me there's there's lots of concerns beyond mm -hmm. before to we go further with the discussion you would need to know the same concept that applies to swimming as well because we don't have the swimming facility so the same thing Pete discussed with hockey would apply and, to swimming as well and soccer mm -hmm. Soccer and lacrosse are at That's GPS, right? Yep. In Bedford. Yep. Okay. So as a board, you know, I would say if we're going to make a request to change administration, definitely it's going to be another future agenda item. I know they're definitely, I would say, budgeting for status quo. Um, unless there was a request of us prior to budget season to make adjustments. Uh, we can always make it in our hearings as well if we feel that there needs to be adjustments made. And then, um, so if you're asking for what the costs would be. My first question would be is whether the school district is responsible yep. for those children's transportation because considering it's a, I guess it's a facility that's technically a home situation, but it's. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm going to to this discussion because realize when you don't have the facility and we're going to talk about cost this applies to practice as well so it's not just the game so mm -hmm. each and every day that you're practicing at the swim uh, swimming facility or at the ice hockey facility those costs are going to be involved as well so it's not just the games it's the daily practices as well so it would be no doubt substantial cost in the budget I mean if there's, if there's not a liability to the school district then I'll leave it to the administration to make that decision myself I'm not speaking for the board but just that's my concern at this point. Okay. You know, it, it's something that we certainly could explore too. For example, Gaston High School, they have their home hockey games at the Sullivan Ice Arena at, at, on, on the campus of St. Anselm's. So it, we're, we're not alone, but certainly Mike Susi, uh, you know, he could he could put out a survey to find out, you know, what other schools do. Recently, we, we played Saturday, and uh, I know the – the, the visiting team, they actually, they drove. They they were not bussed. Uh, so it, it's, I think, some, you know, so it might vary from district to district, but I, I think our practice is similar to other schools who, you know, have their home games at facilities that are not at the high school. Would NHIAA be able to offer maybe some statistics on that as well, since we were members? They, they probably would leave it up to the local, to us. Right, but mm -hmm. I mean, would they have knowledge or, or like would they be able to survey um, so that you get like a centralized, you know, to their membership? They, they, they could. I don't know if they ever have, but we, we could certainly find that out. Okay. We could find that out. Excellent. Cinda? <clears throat> so that's one of the reasons I had asked the question because it was, um, I was noticing um, that I thought that might be the case uh, based on my now um, limited experience at the high school with one of my children um, but I started noticing things like you know we provided transportation to Bedford for soccer when they went to like Bedford um, the, the middle school high school but that's just as far you know as the GPS fields that we weren't providing you know transportation to and it really brought up the concept to me of the liability and students piling in a car you maybe you have an upperclassman and you know now you're now you've got you know potential risk of safety risk and so i don't know where we where we stand from a next step standpoint you know other than understanding what that liability is what's the calculated risk as well as kind of what we're looking at costs or if there's a way that maybe um Maybe there's a way to to step to step it up. For example, hockey happens in the winter when the roads are worse or there's icy conditions, and maybe that's something to look at as a greater risk. Perhaps I don't know. I'm just so if anybody has any other ideas, let me know. But um, I think that we need to be aware that there's a risk, and that 
you know, there's it, in some ways we're between a rock and a hard place from a, from a cost and a safety standpoint. So I think, I think we need to know where we stand and at least think about that now or in the future. Andy? I think, like the other topics we've talked, I think this would be a good breakout session after the budget with administration to talk about general transportation because we're funding, there's a request to fund things like like uh, school-owned vans for special services, which could be another avenue that we could take for smaller groups and things like that. I mean, there's, there's many options, but there's also risks and liabilities that none of us are aware of. And I think it would be good to talk just generally about transportation like this as a topic after we get through budget because I don't think we'll sort through it in time for budget but I think it's good to sort of bring it up to the surface Michael um, I think that if it is seen shown that it is a liability issue that I think we should discuss it before the end of the budget season if if it's not then I agree that we can but my only concern is nothing's different than it's ever been if we've been we... doing this for a long time and in order to do this the right way and understand is there enough time to change it? I mean, I want this to be a full thought out methodology, understanding the pros and cons of all this stuff. I don't want us to just throw a bunch of money in there just covering it in the future. I'm not saying throw a bunch of money. I'm saying that if we understand it's a liability, I think the discussion should be before the end of the budget season. If it's not, then I think we can have a long thought out process, but. I'm not sure I see the before the end of budget season urgency here, but if it, it, it will the board on this one, so well, we can talk it afterwards. I, I would I'm with okay. Mike. I agree with him. And I would say, um, you know, having those feelers out to um, Mike Susie's fellow ADs will be helpful if we can get that in the short term. I know uh, he's new and getting to know people. This could be one of those how you doing type calls. Um, and I think that you know we have a very good relationship with legal counsel. And so when it comes to that, I'm sure that uh, they can give insight as far as um, what other districts are doing and what exposure there is. Um, we're kind of fortunate because our legal counsel happens to be a former school board member. So she's, you know, understood both sides of the roles. So on that, I think she can give some very good insight, and I'm sure we can get a quick rendering from Kathy on, on her just off, you know, just thoughts. Because she she's actually Jeffrey Rind. You want to talk rural and having to get somewhere, you get somewhere, and, you know, it takes a while. So I'm sure we have resources to get quick, I would call it, high-level answers and uh, try to go from there. Excellent. Onward Pretty and good. upward. All right, we're continuing with Cinda's questions. This regards gifted and talented transportation. Uh, please tell us more about this line item. Do you want me to read the parenthetical, Cinda? I can, I can speak to it. Sure. Um, so as I was going through this, and, and this is something we can come back to at some other time too, and it's um, basically my it's a side note of calling it the district-wide gifted and talented program, um, meaning that is there is it an out-of-date description? Other than not the hottest button that we have to deal with, but to me it's a label, and I think a lot of children are gifted and talented, and I feel like the program should be more called something more in line with the rigor or the enriched or accelerated learning <coughs> or – you know, something focused on the services that we're offering versus the label of the student. So, okay, Marge. So when Mark and I conferred about this, knowing that it was on uh, the question page, we'll definitely come back to it. Um, but we thought it was better put after um, after the budget because there are some direct implications, and its title is there for a purpose. Based, based on assessment, et cetera. So we just need to go through the whole of it so it's understood. Yeah, as long as we understand that, because obviously we don't want any unattended consequences with um, requirements that we might have, regulatory and whatnot. So <clears throat> I get that. So then we choose to defer the question? Um, I think I still wanted a little bit more about the line item. Let yep. me see. Okay. Uh, Rich? Um, in the past, Gift of the Talent is, has uh, helped uh, fund and facilitate the trips to the Museum of Science, uh, the Museum of Fine Arts, uh, the <laughs> Women's History Walking Tour State House in Boston, the Freedom Trail in Boston, the Courier Museum in Manchester, the Hood Museum of Art in Dartmouth, as well as uh, trips to the National uh, New Hampshire National History Day in Plymouth University, as well as National History Day in Washington, D.C. 
Okay. A uh, question about co-curricular supplies at MHS. Please tell us more about the new clubs, additional supplies needed, and awards. Pete? So I got, we got another handout for you. This is a nice handout. So I just, I just wanted to show you, uh, I think a lot of people, if they don't know, how many clubs we have, that we have at Change the standard for grief. So we have the service, you know, orientated clubs, uh, and we have, you know, we have clubs that compete, and we have, you know, the I put the other clubs under all all other clubs, but I'll talk about these new ones. So the new clubs for this year are the science fiction club. The supplies associated with this club are purchases of science fiction books and DVDs, computer building clubs, parts associated with computers and assembling the computers, uh, film study club. Uh, this club will have a film festival this spring. Uh, the advisor is pretty excited about that. Uh, they would like to purchase two cameras for next year. A creative writing club. The advisor for this club would like to purchase writing journals. Another cl cl new club we are very excited about is Strong Woman in uh, Strong Girls. This club empowers girls to imagine a broader future through a curriculum grounded on a female role models. Uh, this year, for an intramural sport, we have uh, the intramural activity. We have uh, table tennis, and the costs associated with this would be ping pong balls and paddles and nets. And as far as awards go, uh, typically, you know, a club will have an end of the year recognition evening. National Art and Honor Society, National Honor Society, they always have like certificates and pins. Actually, you opened up a door for me, Peter, and the question I had was clubs that compete, and one was marching band, and that's not a club. You don't compete. You lose a grade. You, right. get, a, you get a zero, and it affects your GPA. So I look at that as a, a class element, like a project or something like that. So I, I question it being funded out of, of this area. You know, when they do compete, obviously, it, it measures, you know, areas for growth, et cetera, but... If they don't compete, it does affect their grade. So it's a class requirement. So are there any others? Like, and I know we have a Science Olympiad class. Do they have anything that would fall under that category as well? No. So this is the only one that, to me, seems a little misfiled mm -hmm. because, you know, no, no play, no grade. So, Michael? Just for clarification, that the reason that they get a grade is because they don't have to take the music class. Is that correct? Not at all. Okay. If you're in the band and you're 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 required to be a marching band, so, unless you're on the team playing the sport that you're mar not marching for. So just just clarification: having been down this band route before, there are band performances at the football games, mm -hmm. but then there are also competitions that are. Right. Outside of that, yes, the Salem to, uh, band Salem show. Salem band show. There's usually one out in Monadnock area, and also the 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 instrument band goes to like large group. Now, my understanding is those events don't affect grades. The, festi those, the, the festivals, the festivals, they festivals, don't. No. They don't. Right. But right. the marching right. band does. When you're do if you don't do the Salem band show, it affects your grade. You get a zero for not participating. It's kind of right. I mean, so there's a gray area between. The marching band being a part of your grade, because I know it adds to the grade part of it, but there's also festivals and other things that could be called com competing, right? So there, it is a gray area, um, and also like with large group and things like that, even not in marching. So I think it's something, a little bit of both, right? It's it's a blended sort of area, right? But to me, again, just to clarify, as someone who actually has two kids in in the program, so I'm in it all the time. <laughs> that this is one that if you don't do it affects your grade. So to me it's an academic requirement. Um, if you are in small group, if you're in solo, if you're in um, other than large group ensemble, which um, is actually the whole band, when the whole band competes, a whole band also will affect your grade. But only small group and solo ensemble, those kind of competitions are not an impact of your grade because they are a voluntary, um, basically to, to get measured on individual or, or, or uh, small group performance, but it's, it's more of a uh, resume builder for, for kids applying to colleges, but it has nothing to do with their report cards. But marching band and the Salem marching show absolutely do. But I think to Andy's point that some of them don't, so therefore they right, can still be... Right, but nothing marching band related it, is what me. I'm saying, Hold though. I, 
Well, is it the marching band that goes to these festivals? No. It's the marching band goes to the Salem Band Show. That's it. There's not a Monadnock one anymore. I've been, last couple of years there hasn't been, but that's the only competition they go to. I think it's something to let the administration take into advisement and review for next year. Well, I just don't want to take from co-curricular funding. That's my, that's my, that's my point of the conversation is that if it's a requirement for the grade, it should not take away from co-curricular funding, which should be as completely voluntary. Cinda, do you want me to pursue the math text question, or am I to pass on that? We can skip over that one. I think okay. that we've discussed it All right. quite a bit already today. Then I'll go to the next question, which is regarding uh, additional equipment in the tech ed department. She asked if you could tell us more about this item. Rich? Well, it's essentially the same answer as I gave before in the sense that we had four trainers donated. We were asking for one more to make a complete class set, and the um, the start cart would be able to assess the success of the students that are working on those trainers. Um, that's those items. Yeah. Okay, we go to Mike's questions. I, I believe some of these are answered, Mike. Do you want further explanation with regards to the site licenses and the math new text? Um, so in regards to the site license, it said 126. So if the student population fluctuates, is there going to be a cost fluctuation for the site license? Okay. I think if I recall correctly here, I'm going off the top of my head. We've anticipated in, in buying enough text that have associated licenses as well as additional site licenses for um, the sort of uh, trends of, of prior enrollments. Um, I anticipate that we would be able to meet all needs despite any sort of fluctuations coming down the road. Obviously, if there was a drastic one, we would perhaps have to come if all of a sudden we had uh, more kids in geometry than we ever had in the past. But I think we've anticipated um, a, a margin of error so that all kids would be able to ha get a site license. And then regarding the volleyball chairs, I'll ask for, I guess, point of order. I, I, if we want to just verbiage changed within the budget, is that something that has to be voted on or can we just change the verbiage for the budget that's sent out to the public so instead of saying chairs for volleyball we can say chairs for sports or athletic chairs or athletic yeah exactly so something to be a little more broad so that someone that doesn't read it doesn't see us just buying chairs for volleyball Is that something we have to vote on, or is that something? No, that I, th I okay. think. Sorry, I, I think we all had the same question. Actually, <laughs> I actually with I withdrew my question because it was asked a couple other other times when I got my questions over uh, sent over to me. So I withheld just for lack of Thank redundancy. You. But yeah, can I just ask Mike, what are you referring to? Because are you referring to something that's online, like our budget on online? Right. So yeah, they don't think because the budget committee already has their books and so on. So you're talking about just making the correction online or a clarification. Uh, yeah, just a correction for any uh, any public documents that are out there and any future So with the budget committee, we'll go through that when we're with them, I think. I think yep. it would be easier because we'll pass out the graphic and talk about it. And I think that under that line item, too, you could add a date added in response to school board, you know, questions with the school board so that anyone who looks at it sees that that line item description was updated at, at, after our meeting on this date. So it's not, you know, like yeah, exactly. It's yeah. just that further yeah. clarification requested by a school board or something. And you can put the date so it's not like it's kind of been a swapped out or something like that. Gotcha. Okay. Okay, we go to Naomi's questions. Naomi, do you need further clarification with regards to the district print shop? Okay. And how about the question regarding the technology equipment, which is the engine start cart and the engine repair trainer? I'm all set. Thank you. All set. Well, hopefully we have answered your questions to your satisfaction, made some clarifications to you everyone's always, benefit. You always have the most fascinating questions? hearing, don't you? <laughs> we get into such such the the when, granularity of what you do because you have the most sophisticated of, mm -hmm. of budgets to develop with moving parts yes. so you have a it you shows you have a lot going on absolutely um, are there any other questions from the board on the budget being presented by the high school 
Seeing none, the hot seat can cool off now. <laughs> you are done no, for the great. night. It was a terrific question, so thank you very much. We enjoyed the dialogue. Thank you very much. And now we're on to Marge, Mark, and Matt with District Wide. So what I would just say, if you look at our, our section of the budget, note that we really tried to do a lot of le level funding and looking at all the items. You see some minor adjustments, but I think the questions that you've posed um, really get to some of the items that need clarification. And um, those are all Matt's accounts that he oversees, so he's going to ask the question and give you the response. Thank you. Um, they're not personally my accounts. They belong to the uh, Merrimack School District, but oversee the accounts. Yes, correct. Uh, the first one is from uh, Vice Chair Schneider about the long-term disability account. Uh, the 1617 actuals are much higher than budgeted, and the 1819 budgeted are at that level. Can you provide details as to why this is, is significantly higher than previous years? Um, Last few years, we've had some higher than average claims experience, which drives up the the rate, and so that's why the uh, the spike in this uh, particular area. Uh, this isn't one of the accounts that's covered by Primex, where we have a, a rate cap on it, but uh, this is based on. Uh, previous uh, three years of loss runs and whatnot and uh, we've had some uh, higher than average uh, claims so thus the uh, the increase um, the next question if I may um, the transportation contract this is our regular ed transportation contract uh, it's with STA uh, a few years ago um, when we initially bid this out, we did a yeah, five-year contract, and three years into it, we did a renegotiation uh, for, an, for a five-year extension. Uh, that took place in 1617. So going from 1516 to 1617, there was zero increase. That was part of the renegotiation. Um, 1718, there's a 3.25% increase. 1819, there's a 3.5% increase. 1920, three and a half, and the last year of the extension is in 2021. Will there be a three and a half percent increase? So we went from zero to three and a quarter in the last two years to three and a half percent. Is there the opportunity to look at route and or bus size optimization during the contract period to help manage costs? Uh, this is something that we always do look at it to be at the beginning of the year and sometimes adjust during the uh, the middle of the year depending upon ridership um, there's not a lot as far as what we could do to adjust things uh, significantly as far as decreasing the number of buses because right now a lot of our routes although you may see 25 30 kids on a bus at a time um, are very lengthy uh, and that's the one of the main complaint we have from uh, parents is some routes are 45 minutes to an hour because they have to get from the center of town almost to Amherst and then turn around etc. Um, the number of buses you have um, is basically you know a function of your enrollments, the number of stops and then the square miles that the bus has to travel. I know STA has some um, root management software that they're they're setting up to see if they could do a computerized simulation of that that's something that we'll be working with them over the next year or so uh, to see if it will help but they do have a uh, program that they're trying to get off the ground and uh, we'll have to provide them with some information on our enrollments and it's an odd feeling here is it still okay all right okay We'll have to provide them some information on the, uh, you know, our, our enrollments and then uh, where we expect the stops to be and work together and see uh, if we can uh, come up with something uh, of significance. But we did, uh, we used to have larger buses and we went with all 77 passenger buses. We used to have 84 passenger buses and those are just wasting money so we cut down to 77 passenger buses. Michael, you had a question? 
Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to uh, remember if I recall correctly. Are there state standards for how long children can be on a bus route? Yes, there are. Uh, I don't think there's anything more than an hour and a half that can't be on there. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. That, that is a long ride. There are also state standards where you, you're not supposed to have a bus stop uh, any more than uh, a mile from your house. But obviously we don't abide by that state standard. And there's also another state standard that if you live within two miles of a school, we don't have to provide you transportation. And we also do not do that or else I would be fielding many phone calls every single day with people very angry at me. So we, like, we provide service, especially with the little kids. Yeah. You know, grades K, grades K through four. You know, if you're a kindergartner or you're first grade, we're pretty much we're stopping at your driveway. Uh, that's basically the way it is. So in nice little neighborhoods, um, we may group kids together, younger ages. But if you're kindergarten, first grade, second grade, it's it's pretty much to your door. So that's what we do and how we handle it. When you think of the growth this town has had in the last 15 years, the number of cars that come through and cut through and the rate of speed that you know people are going these days in their cars whether it's legal or not um you know we grew faster than than uh we built the the roads for so i think you know that level of responsibility and safety i just like anybody that questions the uh bus routes just try to go walk on the streets right now during the winter and i'm sure that they'll understand the safety need requirements that i think the administration is doing well for that absolutely Oh, definitely. There, there are roads, you know, Wire Road, uh, Bedford Road, all over the place. Lawrence Road, where where the traffic can can really go. So we we very we limit any walking that that kids do on that road. They could come out to the the entrance to that road, but as far as going along there, we like to keep them probably ten ten feet, eleven feet, fifteen feet back from the road. Then when the bus comes to a complete stop, the bus driver usually signals and they go into the bus and you know. They put their arm out and wait till all the kids get down, and then they can they can go. But they're they're very careful because there's a lot of traffic out there. Absolutely. So, um, oh, Cinda, hi. I would say one of the um, reasons that I would support how we currently do it as well is because of the lack of sidewalks that we really have in this community. It's not a really uh, walking friendly community uh, for the little ones, especially. I know, like where I grew up. I would do more walking to get to the bus stop, but there were sidewalks, there were bike paths, there were um, separate ways that I would have been safer as a child than I think that children would be in this community without without that, especially like Michael said in the, um, the winter. Well, it kind of goes back to, uh, you know, when you think of when you grew up and what era that was from. There's a lot of things we had did and had done, you know, during after school, during summer vacations, whatever that you wouldn't dream of, of letting your child be away from you unsupervised for that length of period as, as it was 20, 30, 40 some odd years ago, just to not say just not the same environment. So um, the insurance liability it's about a 10% increase um, over previous periods. What's changed to result in this sizable increase? Uh, this is where we are with the rate cap program uh, in Primex. And in this particular instance, we just chose to use the 10% cap, much like we use the uh, guaranteed maximum rate increase for the health insurance to come up with a budget number. Uh, this isn't solid carved in stone, but this was a way to arrive at a budget number, hence the 10% increase. So a budget for the worst case scenario and hope for the best. Correct. Yeah. Fair enough. Cinda Gualiumi, health insurance. Uh, she makes a couple of comments, which is very true, uh, just to put the cost of health insurance, excluding dental, into the dis for the district into perspective. Um, you know, she calculates it as around 15% of the overall budget. That is absolutely correct. I remember when I first uh, 
started here. I think the cost of health insurance was around $2 million a year. Now we're looking at like $11 million a year. So as a percentage of the budget, it has grown significantly. We've been fortunate in the last few years uh, due to a lot of initiatives that the district has had with the Health Care Cost Containment Committee uh, to keep those increases rather on the conservative side. Um, this year, I think it was 3.5%, 3.4%. I didn't look at the backup. But uh, I remember a few years um, ago, we were looking at back-to-back -back years of 23%, 25%. 20, I remember 27%. And when you have to go into um, a room and uh, all of a sudden ask for an extra million dollars because of a 20% increase in health insurance, it really kind of takes the, the fun out of the whole proceeding. So the last the last few years, we've been kind of fortunate. It, does, it has gone up, but uh, it has gone up... Uh, um, a lot uh, less than in the past, so we're feeling pretty decent about that. Um, let's see, she makes a comment. you want me to read the comment? Because it's a compliment, and I just love to read those. Uh, thank you for including the last payment information on the debt line items on page 9. Um, what I did when I built the budget, and I've been doing this for the past few years, uh, it's something that I always had in my notes, and I figured, well, gee, this is good information to have. Why not share it? So I put it in the budget. Uh, you know, right now, um, without any additional bonding, uh, we're tracking to be debt-free by 23-24. That means middle school's paid off, high school edition paid off, Honeywell uh, projects paid off, everything's paid off. You'd be, you'd be debt-free at that point in time. Uh, so that's a, a very good position to be in uh, for any district or any town um, in our, our debt limitations uh, that we have currently right now are low. They're very low. Uh, but to be uh, debt free in that period uh, is, is really quite advantageous for any future projects we may want to look at. It's only to our benefit. Um, like I said, the... Yeah, go ahead. Oops, sorry. It's also worth noting that this budget year also reflects the first year in a while that we've not had the natural gas purchase thing. This, I yes. don't believe it's in there. So we're, we're peeling debt off, even in this budget year, to the tune of $186,000. Yeah. That doesn't mm -hmm. show up this time. So. Yeah. Right. I like that term, peeling, peeling debt off. Because, yeah, that was a five year plan we did. And it's amazing how, how time goes by so quickly. And so we've had the benefit of having natural gas at all of our schools, uh, except for uh, Reed's Ferry Elementary, where we can't get a line to. And we had the added benefit of having those old underground oil tanks removed under the same project with the same cost, uh, which, you know, if you would have done that on your own, probably would have been around 20000 a piece. You know, so that was all taken care of. So that's a future liability and a future cost that we avoided because of the whole program. Awesome. And I think Andy was putting his fingers up. I think it was four years for the natural gas, wasn't it? Four years? Yeah, was, okay. I think yeah, it was four. four. Yeah. Yeah. It's like it was yesterday. Yes. Excellent. So are there any other questions on the district-wide budget from the board? I am seeing none. So we will call your hearing closed, too. Uh, so we're on to item number five, which is budget discussion. Um, I know that every year um, we ask, and I believe we've gotten some preliminary ideas, um, if, and I've shared with administration, you know, where we might be going with requests for cuts. So um, those have been sent over um, and gives us op the opportunity to kind of take a look at where we're going. Um, the biggest thing is we've had all of our department heads come to us did anything come up between their presentation and now that we need any further information on? I'm seeing none, except for Cinda. <laughs> I mean, I would say nothing other than what we've already discussed, because right. so, there were some things that had follow-up, but just gotcha. to be clear. Yeah. Okay. So on that note, um, I know that our next agenda will have um, the introduction of warrant articles, and preliminary discussion on that. And um, at our hearing on the 16th, we'll look to uh, make an attempt to put the budget to, um, to the vote. 
if if that works for everyone else. Uh, okay, Andy then Marge, I think. Fight amongst yourselves. She's got the mic. We'll go with Mark. With Marge, I mean, Mark can't even talk. We're not going to ask him to do anything. So um, I think um, <laughs> what my thought would be, given the fact that the 16th is next Tuesday, mm -hmm. um, is that tomorrow night we would try to come before you with some um, tiering of, okay. of cuts. Um, that's our intention um, to just show you what might be, because we're currently sitting at 0.78%. Um, increase and so we would come back and um, show you uh, what might it look like if it was 0.5 percent and give you just um, a look at that. Um, I think um, we think this is uh, a very tight budget. We've we've tried on purpose to uh, bring it to you below one percent uh, with the idea that we know that you have a lot of warrant articles to look at. But I think if we could share this with you tomorrow. Um, it would give you some time to contemplate for next Tuesday. If you're ready, we're welcome to see so it. So I think rather than wait till next Tuesday, it's just too much. Or even if you've got it in your packet later in the week, it would just be too hard to process. I'd rather put it before you, have you um, ask us some questions. It might mean that we have to go back or okay. whatever. But what I will tell you in just the cursory look um, is that Obviously, it's difficult to do because we think we gave you, you know, um, a responsible, a prudent budget, I guess I would say. On the other hand, we understand that you have lots of warrant articles to face and that you want the budget um, to be perhaps even more prudent. So um, I would just say we'll put it before you and have some discussion, um, but we just think it's smarter to give it to you tomorrow if we can rather than wait on it. Like. May go one more. Um, likewise, with warrants, it would be our intention tomorrow to give you what I'll call an outline of warrants, meaning that um, Matt has worked on them, I've conferred with him, um, but we certainly need to know um, what is of interest to you, because right now I would call it by topic, by by things that we've talked about over a long period of time. A warrant really isn't ready until we give it to legal counsel to take a look at, to take a look at the wording and all that. So again, we would ask that if we give you those tomorrow night and just talk to you conceptually, it would be our hope that you would say, these are the ones we're interested, this is not perhaps, we would hold off on that. And then uh, we would come back with the idea that if it's ready for a vote on the 16th, fine. If not, um, they would need to be voted on by February 5th at the latest. Um, so that gives a little bit of space. So just in timing, I'm telling you these. Okay, I think there was Andy and then Michael. Making me do extra work, push that button a second time. Um, my only comment is, and I appreciate what you're gonna be doing because I know some of us have asked for the what if scenario to see what the pros and cons are. So I, I really appreciate it. And discussing the warrants is gonna be key as well because I think we, we all know and, and the public will hear more about some of the things that are in mind that showed up in your budget summary. So I think that's good. Um, one of the things that I, I wanna bring this up because a sort of a request was made to get legal interpretation about um, liability around transportation. We have two meetings before we hand the, the operating budget to um, to the, because I know the warrants don't need to go necessarily, but the operating budget as of next, the goal is next Monday to vote on it, to hand it to the budget committee. So we have tomorrow's meeting and then that. Do you believe that you can provide the information that the board's looking for in terms of transportation liabilities in that tight of a time frame? It's, it's more of a question to understand what Right. I, I think we can have a conversation with Attorney Peel um, whether there is an answer to be rendered um, quickly or not, I don't know. I mean, it might come not tomorrow. It might come later in the week for which we give you that information and discuss it on the 16th. Um, but we'll try and turn it around. I mean, we'll we'll confer tomorrow and and see. I'm not sure of the answer. I, I want clarification myself, and I don't think it counts to say, well, we've been doing it a very long time. We have been doing it a long time, but um, it would be good for us to just um, find out, you know, liability, et cetera. 
So we'll try and provide you an answer, whether it's forthcoming for tomorrow night. I'm just not sure, simply because I don't know her, her schedule or whatever. Okay. May I say one more thing? Because, again, it comes to dates and so on. So um, one of the items that you'll see tomorrow night is a placeholder for full-day kindergarten um, as a potential warrant. And yet um, the kindergarten task force um, uh, with parents um, teachers and administrators is going to do a formal presentation for you on Tuesday. When I say formal presentation, I really mean to say it's really a part of a series because um, they have been before you two or three times. Um, but there were some additional queries that you had, some additional information that people wanted to share. So you will see uh, the group coming before you. Um, on the night of the 16th. So there's a good example of we wouldn't expect you to make a decision until after you have heard their presentation. Mm -hmm. um, and they really need it until the 16th for that to happen. So that's why we think conceptually if we can go through tomorrow night and um, just look at the topics, all of which have been raised um, in my message, but just to go through, then you might say, well, here is one that we would want to put off, or here is one that would be better put over here, or whatever. But everything will be mentioned so that you have a chance to weigh in. Okay. Michael. Um, I'm not sure if this is feasible in the time that you're, you have, but um, I know that you're coming forward with potential cuts. I was wondering if you can um, calculate the overall contractual obligations for increase this year, such as the transportation, the teacher's contracts, and actually show what that contractual increase to the budget was this year also, so that the taxpayers can understand what a impact you've had on actually keeping the budget at 0.78%. Try. We'll try. Yep. Did you do it? Yeah. Okay. So, good talk. Uh, budget discussion has been discussed till tomorrow. And are there any other questions or comments for preparation for tomorrow night and next Tuesday? I feel like you're about to hit the button, Michael. I just thought there was one more subject from the district. That... Uh -huh. yep. Thank you. So one article question, right. Um, so on that note, um, we will close item number five. And I will say that there is no public here. Uh, there hasn't been all night. So we will close public participation on agenda items. And I will entertain a motion to go into non-public session per RSA 91-A colon 3, Roman numeral 2, sections A, B, and C. Do I have a motion? So moved. Made by Mike. Do I have a second? Seconded by Andy. Naomi, how do you vote? In favor. Michael? In favor. Cinda? In favor. Andy? In favor. And I vote in favor. The motion carries 500. Thank you and good night.